Hey, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Hormonally Speaking. I am um, just so happy today to talk with my guests because um, I love talking about yoni steaming in particular. Um, we've had Steamy Chick on in the past. Um, if you missed that episode, go check it out. Um, but it is such a powerful tool, I think, that is um, not talked about enough, uh, first of all, when it comes to a whole bunch of things in the reproductive system. Um, but there's also, you know, so many other elements elements two of energy healing that we're going to get into with today's guests because as we know as whole people we need to hit up all of these different aspects physical emotional spiritual etc so super excited to talk to today's guest who is Samantha Dene and she is a certified holistic and feminine health practitioner endometriosis advocate educator and survivor her personal journey and experience with endometriosis has led her to the destination and purpose of a womb healer. As the owner of Samantha Dene LLC, Samantha provides spiritual healing services such as yoni steaming, Reiki, spiritual massage cleanses, and more to work towards the goal of unlearning to learn and love self and your womb. She also creates holistic products like N-Touch womb detox capsules, a special herbal blend suited for reproductive healing of stagnant blood flow and tissue in the uterine cavity, to create a healthier period for self, other herbal capsules for healing, yoni steam blends, and more. In Samantha's spare time, she educates high school students on period and reproductive, reproductive health and how to advocate for themselves with doctors and family. Super important. Additionally, as a womb motivational speaker, Samantha provides her audience with a real life look at trauma and how it plays a role in your health and physical ailments, how to begin healing by correlating the physical and spiritual to learn how trauma plays the biggest role in your life. Simply, she is your motivational guide to healing yourself and womb. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you for having me, Christine. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I mean, just reading your bio, I'm like, you. I, I love everything that you do and all the aspects that you bring in well, because you. it is so important, right, to sort of target all these different ways, including trauma. We talk about that a lot on the podcast because I feel like that's overlooked a lot when it comes to reproductive health, right? It is. It's yeah. very much overlooked. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, you know, your story and sort of how you ended up doing this work that you do, because obviously you've gone through your own experience dealing with reproductive issues. Ooh, well, it's a long journey. So <laughs> tell us I, all about it. <laughs> so I was diagnosed with endometriosis in 2014. Um, before my diagnosis, my periods had always been really heavy. They were about seven to eight days. I will always have to miss like at least a day of school and work. Mm -hmm. Um, could not eat anything, would always throw up, like even just water, I would throw up and mm -hmm. was just really, really sick. And so in 2014, when I was diagnosed, it was a um it was a blessing in disguise. I had been prescribed um codeine pills mm. for um for my period and I wasn't aware about narcotics and how to take them, especially when they're like really heavy narcotics. Hardcore. Like yeah. And so I was used to taking like sixteen hundred milligrams of like ibuprofen for my period in just like a day and so I took these codeine pills and I took like six of them thinking that it was gonna be okay because they were six milligrams right like, okay 36 milligrams like that's <laughs> nothing for me and the next day I got up trying to go to work and go to class and almost fainted and so I went back to the doctor and the doctor who prescribed me the codeine pills were, she wasn't there. And so I saw another doctor and he asked me, um, he asked me a few questions once I told him about my period. And he asked me if my period is always debilitating every month, if I have issues with sex and if I have um, issues with going to the bathroom. And I told him yes to all three. And he gave me a pamphlet and said, I think you have endometriosis. Wow. And I'm impressed. I, <laughs> right. I, I, and I had never heard of endometriosis before. And I was like, okay. And he said, you know, you're going to have to have surgery in order to be diagnosed. You know, you can't have a CAT scan or MRI. You can't see it under, under those. So you have to have surgery. And I was getting ready to graduate. So I said, okay, I'll wait. Because mm -hmm. I wanted to walk across the stage. Because the recovery is about six to eight weeks. Right. And once I started my big girl job, I had my surgery for coincidentally ovarian cysts. 
Mm -hmm. and I had ovarian cysts that were about to rupture and they were like the same size as my uterus and my uterus was wow. enlarged wow. it was the size of an orange when it should have been the size of a lemon because I've never been pregnant before right and how old were you at the time at the time I'm like 24 okay and wow. so once I had my surgery for my ovarian cysts they saw the endometriosis and diagnosed me with stage one I tried a plethora of birth control pills. I tried um, Lupron Depot, mm -hmm. which for those of you who don't know, it's a chemotherapy treatment that they use for endometriosis. Um, but it's also a prostate cancer treatment that they give to men. So it's pretty, it's pretty rough. It, and doesn't it, it, it um, bottoms out your estrogen, right? Like it really yeah. suppresses it. Yeah. And if you're not on hormonal replacement therapy, when you're on the Lupron Depot, it will send you to basically menopause and right. so I went through menopause quote unquote <laughs> yeah. um when I was 25 and it was rough and about three years later I went from stage one to stage four endometriosis and wow. my period started to become like 90 days for nine months out of the year and so I was basically on my period all year and super years. anemic, I'm sure, because you can't not be when you're bleeding that much, right? Yeah, super anemic. Um, I would always try to go to the emergency rooms for like transfusions to see if I would need them because I was bleeding really heavy and all the time. Right. Um, but FYI for you all, do not go to the emergency room for endometriosis. They are not trained on endometriosis and they will not be able to help you. Yeah. And you're going to be really upset when you get there because they're not going to know what to do. You're going to know yep. more about endometriosis than the emergency room doctors. Um, 100%, yep. And so I was at a loss <laughs> trying to figure out, okay, like how am I supposed to live? Because I'm having my period basically all year. Nobody can figure out how to at least get it to decrease in the number. Mm -hmm. um, I had tried progesterone treatments those weren't helping they were making me bleed heavier different mm -hmm. birth control treatments those weren't working I feel like I tried just about all the birth control treatments with the exception of the IUD and like the diaphragm <laughs> like right I, none of those but nothing was working for me and my doctor she um she told me I could get an ablation but she said, if you get an ablation, your period is going to come back within eight years because even though it's burning the uterine lining for whatever reason, it's still, your period is still going to come back. Mm. And wanted to get a hysterectomy because at that point I was exhausted. Yeah, um, I can imagine. She, she was very adamant about not wanting to do it because I'm so young and anything right. could happen. But she would do it because she knew what I was going through. Right. And every time I would get to a, to pre-op, <laughs> I would cancel and so I guess my spirit was just telling me I should just wait. Something's going to happen. I don't know. Mm. And my doctor suggested that I try holistic medicine. Okay. I'm amazed by this doctor. I just have to say the fact yeah. that she was like supportive in all these directions that not everybody finds a doctor like that. Yeah. Exactly. Her name is um, Dr. Tamika C. Mm -hmm. She's out in Stockbridge, Georgia. Um, very supportive and very supportive um, of holistic medicine and I was very surprised, but she said, you know, we've tried just about everything. I don't know what else to do. So she was like, we have nothing to lose if you try holistic medicine. And if it doesn't work, then we can try something else. And so I got off of birth control and the day that I got off birth control, I also gave up meat mm -hmm. and I gave up dairy, mm -hmm. which is, which was a big problem especially with having endometriosis was a big problem yeah. um and I started to put myself on the yoni steam regimen and within the next month of me getting my period I didn't bleed throughout that time before it was time for my period mm -hmm. and when it was time for my period five days I didn't cramp I didn't bleed heavy Wow. You're like, I've never had a period like this before. <laughs> I felt like the people in the commercials. <laughs> like, it's so wonderful. And like, you can just do anything you want to do and just yeah. live life. Yeah. I yeah. was outside. I was running errands. I <laughs> You're like, I was living my life. Who knew? I completely really forgot that I was on my period. And I was yeah. amazed at like how fast. That's it incredibly fast. Yeah. So 
the fact that it could happen because I've never had a period like that before. I've never had a period where I didn't cramp and I didn't bleed heavy and mm-hmm. I wasn't touching my pad, you know, mm-hmm. every hour, every two hours. Mm-hmm. This is completely new for me, but it showed me that it's possible. Absolutely. It will work. Yep. And from there, I kept up with no meat and no dairy. Mm-hmm. So with um putting myself on a yoni steam schedule and I started in taking more herbs and the yoni steam blend that I put together is actually the blend that is in my detox capsules. Mm. Because here, people will take a capsule more than they will yoni steam because either they don't know how to yoni right. steam at home right. or they don't know about yoni steaming mm-hmm. and they're skeptical, so they're not gonna really try it. But everybody can take a capsule. Yeah. So everybody's used to taking <laughs> taking those, yeah. <laughs> And so for like a year, I kind of just tested it out as a Yoni steam blend. And then I switched over to capsules just to see. And I had my third laparoscopic procedure in, at the end of 2020. And my doctor saw no endometriosis tissue. I had tissue on my fallopian tubes, my uterus, my colon, and my kidneys, and my bladder. She didn't see any tissue. Wow. Now I can naturally conceive. If wow. Wow. Whenever the spirit is ready for me to to, to be yeah. there, yeah. I can actually conceive. Um, my periods are still five days. I don't cramp unless I ate something, you know, in the morning. Right. That, I, you know, that wasn't eat. good. Like, right yeah. before my period, I might have fallen to a craving that I know I didn't have. No yeah. before, but outside of that, like I, 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 I rest because I've really been intentional about trying to rest at least for the first couple of days of my period. And I'm, and I sleep a lot too. Yep. Naturally during my period. So I try not to, I try to rest, but if, if in the event I can't, because I have clients that I have to give mm-hmm. services to, I still can get up and go give the services and be just fine. That's an incredible story. And First of all, to that last point you just made, I think that's really important for women to hear that, you know, even if you do have more energy, you know, it, because you've been healing your body and, and you have more energy during your period than you did in the past, it doesn't mean you need to like go, go, go during this time, right? It's really is a time to go inward, really kind of take care of yourself. It's a, the body's natural detox, right? And just kind of supporting yourself during that time um, and kind of going against the grain sort of of what the world is telling you to do, which is to go, go, go all the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really important. Um, and I, I find once you get in the habit of making at least those few days during your period, your designated rest time, mm-hmm. not only are you going to look forward to it because you know, at least I'm going to sleep at this time during the, during the month, especially if you're really busy during, the, uh, during those other days during the month. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Also getting to really love on your womb. I think of my womb as a separate entity now. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Getting, letting her rest because throughout the month, because I'm so busy going, 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 and I'm doing energetic work and I'm doing creative right. work. Right. She's been used a lot throughout the month, even though I'm not on my period. And even throughout right. the menstrual cycle itself, with all that comes within the different phases that your body goes through, like through an ovulation and through your luteal phase, your body still needs to rest and your womb is always working. So mm. that's her time to rest too. And I feel like she deserves it. A hundred percent. I give her the respect of resting during my time. And I don't cramp when I'm, when I'm sitting resting. down, it's when, I, it's when I start to move mm. and I start to have to put on clothes and I have to go outside. Cause she knows yeah. when <laughs> I'm getting ready to go somewhere and I'm not, just getting up to like walk into the kitchen and get some water or going to the bathroom. Like she can yeah. tell the difference and she'll start to tense yeah. up a little bit. And she's yeah. like, she's just like, uh, knock, knock, knock. <laughs> yeah. Like we are supposed to be playing now. What are we doing? Getting ready to go somewhere. Where are we going? And how long are we going to be there? Because <laughs> I'm ready to lay down already. And yeah. we have a house. <laughs> so if, if you start to think about your womb like that, mm-hmm. I feel like it becomes a lot easier to not only connect to your womb, but to also give her the respect and have the accountability to do the things that's going to help her thrive. Because a lot of times we have ego and we don't want to take accountability and we eat things that we shouldn't have that is going to be a detriment to her. 
and to our periods mm -hmm. and to our menstrual cycle as a whole. Mm -hmm. And we don't really like to take accountability for it. And mm -hmm. if we have a reproductive issue, we kind of always put the blame on that. And it is the reproductive issue, but at the same time, what did we do too? Because right. we know we shouldn't have such and such, or we shouldn't be doing X, Y, and Z during this time. Right. Well, and that's really sort of, I know it's hard when, you know, I've certainly worked with women and you were in this place too for many, many years, right? Of going through all this pain and and really just being almost like angry. You know, I know women that are angry at the reproductive system and I understand it, you know, but at the same time, it's a much more empowering place to be to know that the choices that you make impact your, yes. you know, your menstrual cycle, that it's not just this thing that's happening to you or, or your body being against you. Cause I think that's what a lot of people can fall into. Like my body just hates me or my, you know, my uterus hates me. And it's, it's like, that's not really an empowered place to be. Right. Because it's like, how can you get better if this is just sort of happening to you versus like you have a role in it. And it's not to get into like a blame and shame, mode but just you know understanding that you do have the power to shift things and i mean as you showcased like pretty quickly right from the extreme that you were at with bleeding like 90 days at a time to one month after doing these things it just i mean your body was like we're ready to heal yes i felt like my wound was telling me for a while to get off the birth control mm -hmm. and I feel like my body is one of those bodies where I can take medication for like a week or so and it'll work. Mm -hmm. After that, it's right like now. my body has adapted to it and so it's not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. But I was very nervous and anxious to get off of birth control because my period before I started the birth control was 10 times worse than the 90 day period that I was having. And the 90 day period was bad because I I couldn't walk. I was walking around with the cane. I put myself on bed rest for like two months um, because wow. I couldn't keep food down. Everything I would eat, I would throw up. I was like really, really sick. And But I was really contemplating on staying on the birth control because I did not want to go back to the period before that because it was so much worse. But there, I think is when it comes to the, the anger part of, of our bodies, I feel like we should sit in that, but we shouldn't sit in it too long because mm -hmm. I was angry and mm -hmm. I was angry at my uterus for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I was asking like, what, what did I do? Did I do something in a past life to deserve? Like, right, right. You question, yeah. What, like what happened? Because nobody else around me has a period like this. Nobody else that I know has endometriosis. I don't, I've never heard of it before. Mm -hmm. So you start to question and you do get angry. And it's a, it's an important, it's an important emotion to sit in, but it's important to not feel guilty because that's where the trauma comes in. And then that's what starts to plague on your wound because then you start to feel guilty for having it mm -hmm. you guilty because you don't know how to heal it or how to at least manage it so that you can have some kind of life and then you feel guilty with what comes with it like you can't hang out with your friends you can't do like regular normal activity right especially in your 20s right I mean it's really hard in your 20s yeah exactly you know like and then you have people who don't understand because they don't live it you know you make plans with people at the beginning of the day and then when it's time for the plans all of a sudden a flare-up has came and you can't move you can't yeah. do anything and they they're upset because Y'all made plans, but now the plans aren't going through and they were looking forward to it, but you were looking forward to it too. It's a lot of emotions that come mm -hmm. with having reproductive issues. Um, sit in it, but don't stay in it because the energy that comes with being angry is something that sticks. And then that's another trauma that you got to work through. Yeah. And then 100%. that's percent. Yep. Yeah, it takes a lot to it takes a lot to not be angry, especially angry at your own body for not doing what you wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that you put it so beautifully because you know we certainly have to be in our emotions and not try and push them down. But the goal is ultimately to process them so they don't get stuck in our body, right? Because otherwise, yeah, it just perpetuates upon itself those traumas, and um, and then it's really hard to get better 
really when you're, you get stuck in that place for sure. Um, can you talk about, so when, first of all, how did you find out about yoni steaming? Was that something that your doctor told you about, or you were just researching? And then how did you kind of figure out which herbs to use? Um, so no, my doctor didn't tell me about yoni steaming. I, I feel like I was led to people who are into holistic medicine and mm -hmm. into holistic care. Um, and so there's this um, woman by the name of Imani, but people, she's known as the hood healer, but she gave me a reading and she was mm -hmm. the one who told me that I needed to get off birth control and stop eating dairy and change my diet and everything. Um, and she sent me to another woman named Imani, who is a herbalist. Mm -hmm. And she gave me like a bunch of teas to try um, that would be helpful for my period. And then she kind of talked about yoni steaming, but not really in depth. And so I kind of did my own research when it came to yoni steaming after I heard about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a rabbit hole to go down to when you're, <laughs> when you're learning about holistic medicine like this uh it's very overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, true. One, but if you're interested in it enough, it's a pleasant rabbit hole to go down. So I did a lot of research. Um, and there's a woman, she's my mentor now. Her name is mm -hmm. LaShawn. She has a Yoni steaming, um, she has a Yoni steaming place here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And she gave me my first Yoni steam. And from there I was very much intrigued about mm -hmm. The whole practice of yoni steaming because I've I had heard of yoni steaming before, but people call them hip baths or sits baths or something uh, like that. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. So I never put together that those were the same thing. Right. I don't think yeah. I have ever thought that way. <laughs> yeah. But the reason, but now that I practice yoni steaming, now I can tell why I never mm -hmm. correlated the two because when people refer to them as like hip baths or sits baths, I don't feel like they dive into the spiritual practice. Mm. It's kind of just steaming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not steaming with a purpose. Mm. The yoni steaming is made to be with a purpose. And once I started, once I got my first yoni steam and I saw the process and just like how it goes, mm -hmm. I pretty much made my own yoni steam at home. It's mm -hmm. like, Got a pot and yeah, the basic the basics. Yeah, just over the pot for like fifteen minutes. <laughs> That's how I've always done it. Because <laughs> she told me when well, you have endometriosis, not to steam for longer than fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. So I would just pot over the pot for fifteen minutes, grab a little skirt or or blanket and to mm -hmm. keep the steam in. Um, but the more I learned about yoni steaming, was the more I learned about herbs because they come hand in hand. And so mm -hmm. I just started to educate myself on herbs and like what they're used for I have like a notebook now I have a, a herb book that I bought from Amazon it has like all the herbs in there mm -hmm. and what they do and really it was just my spirit picking the herbs for yoni steaming and mm -hmm. what I would find at the herb stores I'll start with that and then when when I get home I would just pick just what I thought should go in the blend and mm -hmm. Feel like so, my ancestors will just lead me, yeah. will just lead me there. So that's all how good, I, all yeah. witchy goodness, <laughs> and, and it just works out. And yeah. it's very pleasant to my yoni and to yeah. my womb. Yeah, and I try not to do too many strong herbs. Mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like two strong herbs, and then a few herbs that are pleasant. If I'm going to do mm -hmm. like more or more herbs. Um, Can you give so examples I, of like what strong herbs would be versus more kind herbs or, or pleasant? Doom chai, doom chai is a strong herb. Okay. A standalone herb. Um, you can take that by yourself and it'll work magic. Mm -hmm. um, I think chaseberry is a strong herb. I think dandelion root is a pretty strong herb. Chamomile. Mm -hmm. um, red raspberry. I put it in the middle. Mm -hmm. but at the same time it's pleasant mm -hmm. so it could be used either or I think passion flower is very pleasant mm. rose I like to put rose in everything because it has the highest vibration of any flower so I, I love like rose so I, like to throw it in anything. I wear rose oil now as my scent it's so funny me too like, I was telling somebody recently like I remember when I was young, my grandmother had rose 
you know, mm-hmm. whatever perfume. And I just thought of it as honestly, as like this old person, you know, like old woman thing. I mean, first of all, it was probably from like Avon or something like that. So it wasn't necessarily the highest quality stuff, but, um, you know, it's so funny just as I've gotten older, you know, just especially in the past few years, I love Rose. Like it's just, yeah, it's such a heart scent to me, you know? Yeah. I'm the same way. I used to didn't like the smell of roses. Yeah. Yeah. I, used to, I don't know. It used to make me side eye a little bit. <laughs> but now, like, I love, I love the scent of roses. It's, yeah. I can smell rose a mile away. Mm. Somebody walks past me wearing rose, mm-hmm. I, I automatically know that's rose. <laughs> it's, it is it's energetically, it it really lifts your your spirit. Mm. It makes mm-hmm. you feel like so. It makes me feel super happy once I start smelling roses, and I love roses. I keep them in my house. Mm. So mm-hmm. you got one I'm behind good. you, right? Yeah, but these are the fake. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I keep the real ones in my kitchen and on my altar. I try to keep, I try to buy myself flowers like every two to three weeks for self love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A practice mm-hmm. that I started when I started Yoni steaming and doing my womb healing and everything. That was a practice that I started to do by myself mm-hmm. flowers. Mm-hmm. Nobody was going to buy me flowers. Mm-hmm. I want to buy flowers. So mm-hmm. I, just, I give them to myself. Yeah. I think that's so important, right? Those self love rituals becoming part of this right and giving to your own body um our bodies respond really well to that right so instead of like i don't want to say not worrying about somebody else doing it for you but you know if you don't have someone else doing it for you and even if you do have somebody else doing it for you it's still good to do it for yourself yeah yeah so when you first started steaming how often did you do it i did 10 days a month okay and do you kind of skip days uh yeah sometimes I would skip days sometimes I would do like three in the week and then take the uh, week of my period mm-hmm. as the rest I just take the whole week even though my period is only five days I'll mm-hmm. just take the whole week just to rest gotcha. but break it up in in the months before in the weeks before my period mm-hmm. gets ready to come and so that <laughs> way when my period does come yeah not heavy I'm not cramping I feel like we've had a lot of time to connect within the yoni steaming process because when I steam, I meditate and I mm. do a lot of meditations during my steaming. Nice. And so that way, I tell people don't try not to be on your phone when you steam because that's your womb's time to tell you mm. the trauma, What's going on? the triggers, and everything that is going wrong and that you need to be working on. And you can do that while you're scrolling on your phone, on social media, while you're sitting, you know, on the pot. That's not the purpose of the Yoni Mm Steam. You need to keep your womb her time. Mm -hmm. So true. And, you know, any time that we can actually set aside to not be on screens is a good thing in general for our (laughs) health, right? (laughs) It's like, we need bigger breaks. So uh, so you're not supposed to steam while you're on your period, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, it's a, oh, you just want to like, let everything. Yeah, it's down. already, a de- it's already a detox. Your period is already detoxing and the Yoni theme is a detox as well. So mm-hmm. that's double detoxing and you, it's, it's a already, intense. Yeah. Your period is already enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Let it be enough. Yeah. Let that be enough. Yeah. And you know, you're using herbs and the herbs are strong. Yeah. And yeah. that steaming and letting those herbs inside your uterine cavity while your uterine cavity is trying to push out mm-hmm. all of the things that it's been having backed up for the month mm-hmm. yeah not a good idea <laughs> <laughs> do you still steam as often now at this point mm-hmm. yeah I okay do. yeah yeah so i yoni i um i service clients um out of a spa in atlanta mm-hmm. um, called ewe fresh and so they're when I'm in between clients or before my clients, I'll steam nice. when I'm there and then I'll have my steam days at home. That's great. Cause especially with something like endometriosis, mm-hmm. I imagine you want to keep up with it, right? Because I mean, obviously it's a, you know, it's not classified autoimmune disorder yet, but it is something that will ascend. Yeah. Essentially. It, it, could, come come, it could come back mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to keep it as far away. Yeah. I can. I'm, yeah. I, I want to keep this energy with this body as long as I can because a lot of times 
when you have endometriosis and you get a laparoscopic procedure, the symptoms of endometriosis come back within like six months to a year. Wow. And that's no time to feel normal or mm -hmm. no time to have like a manageable life that you could really enjoy. Cause you have right. to, you got to get past the, the, the being tired for all those years of, of dealing with the endometriosis. And now you're feeling good and trying to get your energy back. And it's like the moment you start getting your energy back, then you start feeling the endometriosis symptoms start to come back. Yeah. And that you have to go through surgery in order to even feel temporarily better. Right. I mean, surgery is so intense on the body. Very intense. They don't, they really downplay that. When, 100%. when you have surgery, they really downplay how, how traumatic it can be. And yep. the recovery, the recovery is not easy. Not easy. I know. So I had a fibroid removed. Um, it was my first surgery ever. And um, even, you know, well, I'll just say what happened to me. So they unknowingly burned me in three places in my intestines during that surgery. So I ended up with sepsis two weeks later. I lost half my colon. I lost eight inches of small intestine. I had a temporary ostomy for about six and a half months. So it was traumatic to say the least, you know, but, but one of the things that happened was, you know, the two weeks after the surgery, um, you know, they, they tried to say, oh, you know, you bounce back pretty fast from myomectomies, you know, right. And um, I kept just thinking, oh, my body is like, slow to recover and all of these things. And what a disservice that they did and not saying, Hey, if you're not, you know, like if basically these are what things should look like and, mm -hmm. you know, yes, it may take longer to get better. And if you're just kind of continuing to not get better, you okay. need to go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I went, I went to the premier, I never say the name of it, but the premier um, laparoscopic gynecological surgery center in the Southeast to get this done. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyways, and I, yeah, first surgery ever led me to three more surgeries because I had two emergency ones and then one um, where I reversed the ostomy. But yeah, I always tell women now, like be very um, in tune with your body post-surgery, A, it's probably going to take a lot longer, like give yourself more downtime than the two weeks or three weeks sometimes, especially with laparoscopic surgeries that they're, mm -hmm. they recommend. They're like, oh, it's not as long, you know, easily. I mean, just because they don't cut you open doesn't mean that everything that they're doing in there doesn't completely throw your body off, you exactly. know? I'll tell you the recovery is two to four weeks. It's yeah. really more like six to eight. You can't exactly you can barely breathe in the first two weeks. Yep. You you try to sitting try sitting up and trying to breathe at the same time. Right. Right. Because even horrible. Yeah. Even with laparoscopic surgeries, it impacts your abdomen too, right? So it's like it's it, your abdomen is so sore and in pain all the time. So like you said, just like sitting up, you're like, oh my god, you know, and yeah, they really downplay. Yeah, they do, and I feel, and I find, or I feel like, in my experience, the more you have surgery, the harder the recovery becomes. Yeah. Yep. Every Absolutely. time. Yeah. Is every time the recovery gets a little bit harder. Harder. The more yeah. You have surgery, and you have more scar tissue, and just you know all of these things, right? So, I mean, the gift that you are giving to people you know, sharing the story and obviously working with women with uni seeming is so powerful, right? Because it's like this massive tool that keeps, keeps you out of surgery, right? I mean, you guys research uni steaming. I know people have their um, ideals about mm -hmm. it, but research it because it can really be helpful and it can really be a helpful way for you to become in tune with your body and know when your body is telling you something is wrong. 100%. Absolutely. I really ignore that. Yeah, absolutely. So since I brought up having a fibroid myself, and a lot of people that listen to the podcast have, you know, dealt with fibroids. And I mean, they say 80% of women will have a fibroid by the time they're 50. You know, is some is yoni steaming? Do you feel like that's good for fibroids too? Yes, yoni steaming is very good for fibroids. Um, It helps the, the steam and the herbs help to shrink your fibroids. Mm -hmm. Um. So the more you do it and can make it more of a practice for yourself, 
the better chance you have of shrinking naturally the fibroids so you don't have to have surgery because I know a lot of people are really afraid of surgery but specifically that surgery mm -hmm. a lot of people seem to be afraid to have so if you want to try your mm -hmm. hand at shrinking your fibroids naturally I suggest yoni steaming mm -hmm. and I suggest not eating any dairy mm -hmm. because yep. dairy causes inflammation and that is what that is what it, the the reproductive diseases are feeding off of especially when you have like fibroids and endometriosis that's like candy Mm -hmm. so you just stop eating dairy and put yourself on a yoni steam regimen i would suggest doing that and naturally shrinking your fibroids and seeing like how much better your body feels seeing how much seeing seeing the difference in your period because you'll see that you'll start to see the difference you won't bleed as heavy because i know mm -hmm. when you have fibroids you bleed really really heavy yep um, a lot of times when you have fibroids on the outside, you have like the little, the gut, kind of like the gut pouch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's inflammation. Yep. And it will go away if you mm -hmm. stop eating food, if you stop eating foods that causes inflammation. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if you do that with yoni steaming and you shrink the fibroids and your gut will shrink at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All good things that come together. Yeah. Work that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think that's so important. And it's a good reminder, honestly, because I had been um, steaming for a while. Um, I can't remember if that was pre fibroid. It's probably post. Um, and I got out of the, you know, you just kind of whatever, get out of the rotation of things. And I'm like, this is a great conversation to get me back into it because, you know, the thing about, fibroids is they often come back. I mean, most of the time they come back unless you get to the root cause of why you have them in the first place. Right. And, and I do, I do all the things to keep them at bay for sure. But I feel like yoni steaming is such a, um, powerful way. And also like you talk, you've talked about the sort of spiritual connection. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of women out there that really struggle to connect to their womb, right? And struggle to connect the, to their vulva, you know, and just like, don't necessarily want to look at it, don't want to like get into the area at all, you know? And so we're, we're going around kind of uneducated mm -hmm. about this super powerful part of our body, right? Um, the like master of our creation, essentially, you know? And so I think yoni steaming is such a good way if if maybe you felt uncomfortable with the area you know with your vulva to like start to befriend it a little bit more yeah because you need to you need to know her mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you need to know your yoni and you need to know your womb mm -hmm. and I, I do feel like yoni steaming can be a good gateway into learning your yoni like I know sometimes, especially if you've been through a trauma with with sexual with your sexual health, mm -hmm. it is difficult to want to look at her and touch her. Yeah. But I promise you it's gonna be the most empowering thing and, and most empowering experience you can have because you'll you'll know what you like, you'll know what you don't like. You'll know when something is, that's when you'll really know when something's wrong. Mm -hmm. When you get to the point where you can look at her and touch her. Because when you interact with people and you interact with people and you don't know, you know, what yep. they have going on energetically yep. or physically, mentally, any of those things. If you can look and if you're comfortable with looking and touching her and something were to go wrong. You're gonna be the first person to spot it out. You're gonna be able to spot it out quick because your body is gonna be your body's gonna be so in tune to tell you that something's wrong. Yeah. It's really, really important. I know yeah. some I know it can be really, really uncomfortable. You should start with like I think you should do like meditations that are mm -hmm. surrounding your yoni mm -hmm. and grab a mirror. And it doesn't have to be a big mirror, a small mirror. Where you don't have to look at yourself, just look mm -hmm. at her mm -hmm. and just focus on her, getting to know what she looks like, getting mm -hmm. ready to love on her and touch her and embrace her. Because honestly, you should be able to pick yours out of a lineup. Mm. <laughs> I like that. I haven't ever thought about that before. You should, right. you should know. And most yours of us well. can't. <laughs> you should know yours well enough to, if you see her, yeah, you know that's her. Yeah. <laughs> 
So <laughs> that's how that's how strong your connection needs to be with your womb and your yoni. Yeah. Oh my God. That's that's really powerful. I think that's that's so true. I mean, I think about, you know, the way that my body in general signals me really quickly now when anything's off because yeah. I've spent a lot of time working on my body and my health, you know, and I know some people are like, well, you're just so sensitive, you know, to everything. And I'm like, it's not that it's I'm actually listening and in tune now. Right. So many of us, unfortunately, and I get why, why we sort of are disconnected for the million reasons of our culture and everything, you know, but um, it really gives us these signals way ahead of it needing to get crazy signals right? yeah. <laughs> that you can't deny anymore. That is true. Your body tells you, your body tells you a lot of times in a lot of ways before yep. it breaks down. Yep. And once your body breaks down and she says, I'm done, it's going to be nothing you can do about it, but break down with it. Yeah. Because she, she done told you a million times what yep. was wrong. You didn't listen, yep. but that's the ego. And that's yeah. what I mean when we, when we need to learn how to balance the ego of mm. ourselves versus mm-hmm. our womb because our wombs are us they're just vibrating on higher frequencies mm. there because we have ego we're just vibrating lower mm-hmm. because we want to listen to the ego and we want what the ego wants and not listening to her mm-hmm. and that's what we got to change yeah absolutely wow so i know that um we uh you mentioned in your bio that you work with high schoolers in your free time on on this can you talk a little bit about that process Yes. So in the Atlanta area, I go to different high schools. It's really just me calling the school and asking, you know, I'm with the endometrial. I'm on the advisory board for the endometriosis national foundation. So I work as a part of their empower project as an educator. And so it's really me calling the schools, seeing who will let me come in and and teach a class. And so when I do teach a class, um, I talk about endometriosis, very in depth. Um, I talk about, period care in general and biologically what that means to have a period because a lot of times they don't know and I know they don't teach that in high school or in school in general Mm -hmm. um talk to them about like the differences in organic pads versus pads that have like toxic products and chemicals Mm -hmm. in them um I talk to them about like the difference between pads and tampons and their diet and what they need to eat because a lot of times kids eat snacks all day and they don't care about yeah. what they put in their bodies but I tell them you know what you eat especially right before your period has a really big effect on how your period is going to be so change that at, mm-hmm. least, at least for the week before your period comes like right. try to change that. Um, right talk about like soaps and perfumes and like how that has an effect on your body and how that can throw off your pH balance um, but I also tell them about my personal story so then that way it's not like some random person coming into their school that they don't know <clears throat> trying to teach them about a subject that they will care about once yeah. they hear it yeah but they don't know they <laughs> care about when yeah. I get it 100 <laughs> percent, yeah so telling them my story um really helps and then that's when they ask a lot of questions um I tell the students the boys specifically if you want to stay in the class Mm -hmm. and learn you are free to Mm -hmm. um I don't tell them what it's about before I start I let them sit through the first five minutes I tell them you know sit through the first five minutes if you want to sit for the rest then you can you can sit Mm -hmm. if not you can get out you know you can go ahead and go to the gym with the rest of the (laughs) Um, but I do have some that will stay in the class and they ask questions too and I figure that's because they know somebody Mm. really with yeah Yeah. Oh, and how like, I mean, how wonderful is that? Because the more that our boys know, the more that our men will know, and the more that, you know, not only can they help in situations, you know, where they recognize this happening, but like the empathy that Mm -hmm. you're creating in them, right? Um, Because our society has really lacked empathy Mm -hmm. around (laughs) women's reproductive issues for Mm -hmm. all of time. Exactly. And yeah. I think it's really important for them to know that like it's bio it's bio it's it's bio. Mm-hmm. So at the base, they should understand mm-hmm. how a period works. hundred percent. And, yes. and understand that because a lot of times when, when we get our periods, our parents will tell us, you know, it's how you wear a pad or a tampon, mm-hmm. this is what happens. But now you can get pregnant and and, and and you need to watch that. So they need to know for that at the basis they need to understand that the reasons 
periods happen and that they can now mean you can mm -hmm. have baby. Yeah, pregnant. Yeah. But mm -hmm. yes, empathy wise, mm -hmm. I think I think we sort of downplay how emotional boys can be, especially mm. around this topic. And I think they are they can be more sensitive if they know because we just deduce periods to you have it once a month is you know really not that bad you mm -hmm. know it's a few days mm -hmm. they, you know we we dumb it down to it being like nothing right i mean in all actuality it should be right right <laughs> it should be every month you have a pleasant period and you're not sick and you're not feeling you know at your worst and can't do anything that's not how it's supposed to be that's not normal right and so you need to start building uh a better view around what a period is and what it can be yeah. and not just leave it at where well, you got a bad period yeah and, yep yeah I'm supposed to do that yep <laughs> it's such I mean that's such incredible work that you're doing overall but I I'm just really inspired around the work with teaching kids because the, I mean it's incredible right I mean and I think it's so true like we I don't know. We just believe things about what kids know and don't know and what they'll be receptive to and what they won't be receptive to. But it's like, you have to try and, and maybe not all kids are going to be into wanting to learn about it, but a lot more going to mm -hmm. than you probably think. And this is literally, you know, particularly with the girls that you're teaching, like you are setting them up at an age where they can make some real differences in the rest of their reproductive life, right? Mm -hmm. And not have to deal with the crazy amount of issues that so many women, you know, that are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s deal with, and even 50s, you know? So um, crazy, cool, amazing work that you're doing. It's my favorite part, because I just remember being a teenager and like sitting in class during my period and nobody mm -hmm. else period was like mine mm -hmm. and everybody knew that I was on my period because I'm always sick during my period mm -hmm. for one that's no fun right. you know for everybody in the school to know like oh she's on her period because yeah. I'm always yeah. but it's also no fun to like have nobody give you any answers mm -hmm. or any any something to make it better or like a why because a mm -hmm. lot of times we need to know the why and nobody has a why right right we feel at least 10% better when we know the why, because then you can try to figure something Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yep. So I figure, you know, if more teenagers start to at least hear the word endometriosis, then it will lead to diagnosis happening earlier. Way earlier. Seven to 10 years to get a diagnosis. And usually by the time you get your diagnosis, it's because you're trying to have a baby. Right. And you can't get pregnant. And now you're trying to figure out why you can't get pregnant. And right. that's usually when people find out and yeah. a little too late by then because the endometriosis has done too bad of a job yeah. to yeah. reproduce the system for for you to naturally try to have a baby so then you got to do IVF and that comes with a host of other emotional problems and yeah. that's a whole nother <laughs> world and realm so the goal is for for people to get earlier diagnosis and, and not just feel like you have a bad period that's what I heard for like a good 12 years. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that you make that point that a lot of women don't find out until they're trying to get pregnant because unfortunately our healthcare system doesn't really care too much about the reproductive system until, you, you know, we're trying to get pregnant because we, so much of our healthcare system believes that's kind of the only point mm -hmm. of the uterus and the womb and all of that, you know, it's just pregnancy. And it's like, we spend the majority of our life, for the most part, most of us, not pregnant. <laughs> the the I mean, we are learning more and more every day how much our womb impacts every other part of our body, you know? So it's just, yeah, it drives me crazy that it's like suddenly they only care when once you're trying to get pregnant, you know? And so that's so much what needs to change in this education for younger people. That's, you know, what's going to do it really. Cause they're going to go in and be like, um, I'm pretty sure I have endometriosis and the doctor's going to be like, what? <laughs> endometriosis? That's, that's what we want. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Know, I already know before the doctor knows and you yeah. can say, no, this is it. And I demand. Yep. Advocate for yourself. And yep. that's what I just, you know how to advocate for themselves. Yep. 
Absolutely. This has been an amazing conversation. I just, I'm so um, amazed by the work that you're doing. I think it's so incredible. And I come to Atlanta usually two, three times a year. So I'm totally going to come and get hundred percent. Yeah. I was like, after we get out, I'm going to get all the information, but i um, super excited. So anybody else that's visiting Atlanta, I should go check you out too. Let people know how they can be in contact with you. Um, my website is samanthadenae.com. You spell my last name, D-E-N-A-E. Also the same on Instagram. If you search Samantha Denae or the Indo Educator, I'll mm. pop up. Okay. Same as TikTok, the Indo Educator, and the same for Facebook. It's, it's search Samantha Denae you'll, or the Indo Educator. I will pop up. Will pop and, up. Um, my my email is the same, like Samantha Danae booking at gmail.com. Okay. If you follow me on Instagram and you have questions or TikTok, send me a DM. I'm not one of those people that will not respond. I will respond to your to your message and try to help as much as I can. But if you want to book a consult, I do own consults. Um, where there are one-on-one consults. We talk for about 45 minutes and we talk in depth about your womb health and your trauma and your triggers. Mm -hmm. And I give you a few techniques on how to start healing and working through those. So you can start really diving into your womb health journey. Nice. Perfect. So wonderful. Thank you so much for giving your time today and sharing everything with us. It's been just amazing. Um, I'm so excited for everybody to hear this episode. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. You guys, I will see you next time.